A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 204th episode of the Together for Education webinar series brought to you by Notebook. As we completed our 200th episode with enormous love and support from you all, we took some pause to sit, think, and prepare ourselves even better for the much awaited season two of this very prestigious webinar series. It was back in 2020 when we here at Notebook decided to launch a platform for the educators to connect meaningfully on discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions. Little did we know that day about this platform growing magnificently big, both vertically and horizontally. We thank you all once again for supporting us and would look forward to your gracious presence in all our upcoming episodes. We have discussed extremely vibrant topics here like digital learning, NEP and assessments, extracurricular topics like sports and theater, topics like school finance and management, and even evolved topics like mental health. Our today's topic is progressive schooling, a thought and an objective that can truly move mountains. Gone are those days, ladies and gentlemen, when school education was only about grades and a secure job. Progressive education is a pedagogical movement that began in the late 19th century, which has been evolving since then. While schools may vary in how they define this approach, the overall objective is to integrate academics with holistic social development. Let's hear from the experts today. Our first speaker on this topic is Mr. Ochin Bhattacharya. Mr. Bhattacharya is the CEO of founder at Notebook, a chartered accountant by training. Ochin was a director at the large prior starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ashton is a member of the Institute of Standard Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, a member of CP Australia and CP Ireland, and a member of SEMA UK. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. An avid reader and a passionate traveler, Ashton has keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategy. Ashim, a very, very good evening. And over to you, please. Good evening, everyone. Gabriel, I hope I'm audible. Absolutely. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. And a very interesting topic. The 21st century is quite different than the 20th in terms of the capabilities people need, be it for work, be it to be good citizens, for self-actualization. And the reason why skills are different are primarily due to the emergence of very sophisticated information and communication technologies. Recently, I was reading an article where economist Frank Levy and Richard Murren highlighted a crucial component of what constitutes 21st century knowledge skills. And I found that very interesting. Just to share with you a few excerpts from there. We all agree that as the world progresses, the labor force is declining in jobs that consist primarily of routine cognitive work, routine manual labor, repetitive work, predictable patterns. The type of tasks that are easiest to program computers and machines to do. Growing proportion of the world's labor force are engaged in jobs. And this trend is only increasing day by day, which emphasize expert thinking or complex communication, jobs of the future tasks that computers cannot do, tasks which require imagination, human emotion. These economists went on to explain that expert thinking involves effective pattern matching based on detailed knowledge, metacognition, the set of skills used by the stumped expert to decide when to give up on strategy and what to try next. For instance, a very interesting example or analogy could be what a skilled physician does when all the diagnostic reports 
are within normal limits, but the patient is still feeling unwell. I think that's expert decision making. Something based on experience, human intelligence, face to face connect, something that perhaps a machine cannot be programmed to do. So, inventing new problem solving when all standard protocols have failed. Now, complex communication requires the exchange of vast amounts of verbal as well as non verbal information. The information flow is constantly adjusted as the communication involves unpredictability. For example, in today's challenging and dynamic setting, a skilled teacher is an expert in complex communication, no doubt about it, able to improvise answers and facilitate dialogue in the unpredictable, chaotic flow of classroom discussion, able to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer discussion, moderate it, ensure free exchange of thoughts and ideas. However, objectively help in navigating the course of discussion towards predefined objectives. Now, as another illustration of how 21st century skills differ from the knowledge communicated by schools to the 20th century, sophisticated information and communication technologies are changing. They're changing the nature of perennial skills valuable throughout history, as well as not only changing the nature of perennial skills, I think as well as creating new contextual skills unique to the new millennium. And again, very important to be in terms of to be professionally successful or to be good citizens in the civil society. For example, collaboration is a perennial capability. Would all agree? Always valued as a trait in, in, in any workplace across centuries. Being a good team player, being able to collaborate, being able to work with others, take, take others along. Therefore, the fundamental work of this sort of interpersonal skill is not unique to 21st century, if you look at it. However, the degree of importance for collaborative capacity is only growing in an era where work in knowledge-based economies, and that's how the, the progression is happening, is increasingly accomplished by, by teams of people with complementary expertise and roles, as opposed to individuals doing isolated work in an industrial setting. So imagine industrial revolution, a blue collar worker sitting in isolation and working on a machine. And imagine today's knowledge economy where people need to collaborate, exchange thoughts. Now further, the nature of collaboration is shifting to a more sophisticated skill set. In addition to collaborating face-to-face -face with colleagues, maybe across a conference table, Today's workers increasingly accomplish tasks virtually, interacting with colleagues effectively halfway across the world, whom they may never meet face to face. And that's how the structure of work is. Thus, even though perennial in nature, collaboration is worthy of inclusion as a 21st century skill, because the importance of, co of cooperative co interpersonal capabilities is higher and the skills involved are more sophisticated than in the prior industrial era. And it's very challenging as well. Similarly, another example can be the ability to rapidly filter huge amounts of incoming data, extracting information valuable for decision making. Now, due to the prevalence of information and communication technologies, for the first time in human history, people are inundated by enormous amount of data that they must assess, manage, integrate, evaluate, rather than rummaging through, through huge amounts of library books to find one piece of knowledge, an activity which was you know, very typical of 20th, 20th century. Users of modern search engines today imagine they receive thousands or even millions of hits within minutes, sometimes within seconds. However, many of these resources are off-target, incomplete, inconsistent, and perhaps even biased. So how do, we, how do we separate signal from noise in a potentially 
overwhelming flood of incoming data. It's a typical 21st century skill. And it's a very valuable capability in order to ensure that decision making is effective. The student's topic is very important because in order to acquire these skill sets, in order to ensure that children are ready for jobs in the future, which do not even exist today. But yes, we do understand how dynamic and how challenging the setting is going to be. Thus, progressive education or educational progressism is a pedagogical movement that, that began, of course, in the late 19th century and has persisted in various forms till the present day. In Europe, for instance, progressive education took the form of the new education movement. Now, the term progressive was engaged to distinguish this education from the traditional one, which took place during 19th century, which was rooted in classical preparation for the early industrial university and strongly differentiated by social class. Now, by contrast, progressive education find its roots in modern post-industrial experience. Most progressive education programs have few qualities in common, which I think are very important and can also be traced back if you look at, if you look at the history to the works of uh, eminent legends like John Locke, Jean Jackets, and of course, the name of John Dewey always comes in. The way I look at it, it was more of a reaction to the traditional style of teaching. A pedagogical movement that values experience over learning facts at the, at the expense of understanding what is being taught. When you examine the teaching styles and curriculum of the 19th century, we all understand why certain educators decided that there had to be a better way. First of all, I think. What is very important is learning how to think. The progressive education philosophy says that educators should teach children how to think rather than relying on rote memory. They argue that the process of learning by doing is at the heart of the style of teaching and we would all agree, we couldn't agree more. The concept known as experiential learning I'm sure all of us are very well aware. We had sessions on this with so many eminent educators in the forum today, using hands-on projects that allow students to learn by actively engaging in activities that put their knowledge to use. Thus, progressive education is the best way for students to experience real-world situations. They actually, in fact, understand as to, as to why they're learning that. What is the relevance? What is the use? And of course, the roots are quite deep. Although it's looked at as a modern invention, it actually has very deep roots. As I told you that the entire progression from 19th century and 20th century, different priorities requirement for different skill sets. In fact, do you argue that education should not simply involve making students learn mindless facts that they, that they would soon forget? He thought that education should be a journey of experiences building upon each other to help students create and understand new experiences. Unless they put their knowledge to use, why will they remember it? He also felt that students' schools at that time, we're discussing about late 19th century, tried to create a world separate from students' lives in complete isolation. Thus, activities in the school and the life experiences of the student outside the school campus according to John Dewey, should be connected. He believed or else real learning would be impossible. Cutting students from their psychological ties, be it, be it society, be it family, would make their learning journeys less meaningful and thereby make learning less memorable, less enjoyable. Another very interesting concept uh, in this regard is that of the Harkness table. The tradition, in traditional education, the teacher leads the class from the front, standing at the front. Whereas the more progressive teaching model sees the teacher as a facilitator who interacts with students and encourages them to think and question the world around them. 
teachers in a progressive educational system often sit among students, maybe in a round table, embracing the happiness mode method. A way of learning developed by noted philanthropist Edward Happiness, who made a donation to Phillips Exeter Academy, a very famous one, and had a vision on how his donation might be used. I remember any, uh, just two lines from there, very interesting, that he said, what I have in mind is teaching, where boys could sit around a table with a teacher who talk with them and instruct them by a sort of tutorial or conference method. That thus, this led to the creation of the so-called happiness table, literally a round table, designed to facilitate interaction between the teacher and students during the class. So these are a few uh, important aspects that uh, I wanted to share. This is a wonderful topic. I look forward to the deliberation of uh, Parit, sir, as well as eminent educators in our panel. And this is a very important topic, the real life experiences. I thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing. Over to you, Gauri. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajan, for those wonderful, wonderful deliberations. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker on this topic is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Zone School in Daradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Zone School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and an acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a vision and exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College, UK in the year 2000. He is also a naturalist, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we here at Notebook are privileged to have Mr. Barrett as our senior advisor. Sir, thank you so much for being here today. A very good evening and over to you, please. So you're not audible. So you're on mute. So you're on mute. So if you can try without the headphone, I think it would work. Now, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, absolutely. sorry for that. Discovery. Very good evening no worries, to all of you. And uh, that was a wonderful um, talk by Achin, who's taken away most of my points, I have to add. Uh, <clears throat> I will say, when I was looking at progressive education, I came across some excellent examples of what progressive, uh, you know, school uh, do for their children. For example, in a school in the States, after studies, in this, you know, history of cartooning, a seventh grader created a graphic novel portraying her thesis. Her exhibition also included her notes, PowerPoint presentations, and a lengthy question and answer session. Another seventh grade student uh, identified a serious need or a problem in the community and created her own nonprofit organization for a year end called the Big Give Project. Students learn early that they, you know, that a community needs, uh, you know, may, may be the same thing uh, that they, they need themselves. Student contacts, students contact stakeholders in the community, develop mission statements, prepare spreadsheets and budgets, and create fundraisers and solutions. Still another school, uh, there was a student who was severely diabetic and he loved uh, skateboarding. As a part of his leadership project, he obtained municipal permits to organize a skateboarding event to raise money for diabetic research and to go door to door to raise awareness and funds. He documented the project, showed his school what he learned and raised thousands of dollars for diabetic research. Coming to the start of it, as Achan said, Progressive education is not a new thing. I've heard of it from the days when I was training to be a teacher. However, I learned, and the first 10 years of my teaching was in very traditional schools. 
And what is a traditional school? <laughs> a traditional school, in my view, was a fallout of the post-war British education system, where cramming, rote learning, to pass exams, to become a part of the workforce for the new post-war world that we live in. Uh, classrooms were normally very silent. They sat in straight rows. Teachers taught. Notes were given. Uh, students then regurgitated these notes at exams to get marks. And the stress was on marks and teaching rather than learning. And that's where I first heard of students who were leaving the schools I worked in to go to progressive schools. In Gujarat, I'd heard of a school called Atlavia. There was schools in Bangalore, Pune, Hyderabad. And these schools, even in Chennai, uh, these schools uh, really heard that they were progressive. But then when we looked into it, we found that these schools were different to the schools that we were teaching in. And uh, how were they different? You know, basically, again, as I said, the main thing was the stress was more on learning. Um, it was a reaction to uh, or a response to the traditional methods because the need and demands of society were changing as Archan did. Um, there was much more experiential learning, hands-on learning. There was flexibility in the procedures of learning. The needs of the child came into the forefront. There was a lot of integration of academic and social development. Students, as you said, around the Harkness table were participants of the learning. They were, they were not re recipients, they were participants. There was a lot of project work, a lot of research work, a lot of integration of technology. Uh, homework was not given too much. It was basically class activities. There was less teacher talk time and more teacher as a mentor watching the movements of the students. There was skill-based learning. There was much more democracy in the classroom. There was collaborative learning. And the emphasis was on long-term learning skills. It was not what you learned as much as it was how you learned. There was also an integrated curriculum. You know, the sciences were not compartmentalized as physics, chemistry, and biology. They're a science project. You could do a project on fire. You could do a project on water and combine all these, uh, all, all the sciences. Um, uh, examples, you know, a three-month unit about food might start with students being asked to list, you know, all the wonders, the wonderful food they like. Uh, their inquiries into... Um, you know, into where these foods came from. There was biology of the different types of nutrition. Um, there could be geography, could be climate, could be cooking, markets, culture. There was also psychology. So just a topic like food would, would, in, would enable all the subjects to get together. There was also emotional intelligence that was being inculcated by students working socially together. They asked questions. Um, there was a lot of critical thinking. Uh, they made informed decisions. Uh, they worked as a team. Also, there was a lot of curiosity and self-inquiry. To add to that, they were, there was also a promotion of the bigger goal, goal in mind, teaching students about social responsibility and democracy and their power to change things, imbibing in them importance of community, service. There was also picking different learning sources over textbooks. In my days, the textbook and the teacher were the only sources. Today, there were so many, and they have to learn which source to use. There was also emphasis on the growth mindset, uh, which Kyler Dweck talks about, not the fixed mindset. Uh, performance assessment through evaluation of student projects. Um, there was also a utilitarian approach to education, which means students were helped to pick subjects uh, and make and, and, and they were made to see how knowledge of these subjects could be put to use together. And you know, there was there were so many <clears throat> uh, new things that 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 progressive education brought about. Now, there are a lot of things. Uh, I mean, traditional schools will also talk about that they have also gone progressive, but um, they do it in small ways. Some project-based learning and some 
multidisciplinary classes do happen in traditional schools. So do hands-on learning and trips. The difference between a traditional school and a progressive school is that these approaches aren't just offerings. They are fully integrated full-time in a progressive school. And um, therefore, a progressive school will have its own problems. Um, basically, <clears throat> um, a progressive school would you know, be expensive. It couldn't be for everyone. Uh, they could, it would be for a select type of student. You know, again, that socioeconomic factor that Achin talked about. They are resource incentive, uh, in, intensive. Um, they can't typically offer assortments of foreign languages and competitive sports. Uh, their teachers undertake extra demands. And therefore, um, you know, progressive schools are not as uh, easily to be found as, as normal traditional schools. So while progressive education is there to stay, it's coming in more and more with these international exam boards. However, it's not for everyone and uh, it's got to grow slowly. Uh, with that, Gagori, I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for those wonderful deliberations. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, to discuss this topic further, we have a wonderful panel lined up for you today. But before we start with the panel discussion, a little bit about us here at Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech platform that creates short videos pertaining to the school curriculum. This means that every topic from every subject of the school syllabus has been covered into a series of short videos that can be used in two different pieces. One is when you as a teacher are starting out a topic in your classroom, you can play one of these videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. These videos are just six to 10 minutes in duration and take up very little of your class time while offering the right kind of material to students to generate curiosity and excitement. The second is when the student is studying at home months later, they have access to the same videos on their personal devices, be it a laptop or a smartphone. They can watch the videos over and over again until they get a very clear understanding of the topic that you have taught. What I am going to do now is play you a mashup of notebook videos so that you know what they exactly look like. We have already discussed how Gandhiji was not only a good caregiver but also an excellent coffee maker. Interesting, wasn't it? Today, let us quickly recapitulate the lesson. We are sure it will help you revise your story. Today we are going to discuss the chapter How, When and Where from your Class 8 History Syllabus. How many of you dislike history or find it boring because you think it is all about memorizing dates? Well, history is about the changes that occur over time. Hence, it is about the comparison of the past and the present. Shishir Bosch and Akbar Shah bought several materials to prepare for Shubhasu's escape. They got salwars and a black fez or felt cap, pillows, shirts, a suitcase, a bedroll and ordered for calling cards bearing the fake name Muhammad Ziauddin. Kabhi kabhi hum log barat ka bhi julus nikalte the. Lotne ke samay khatoli par lal ohar dal kar usme dulhain ko chadha liya jata tha. Lot aane par babuji jyo hi ohar ughar kar dulhain ka mukh nirakne lagte tyo hi hum log hans kar bhag jate. बचपन का मतलब ही है मौज मस्ती का जीवन अगर बच्चे शरारत ही ना करें तो फिर बच्चे कैसे Please get in touch with our sales team at sales at the notebook.school. With that, it is now time to introduce the wonderful, wonderful panelists that we have with us today. We have with us today Mrs. Hemlata Surema. Man is a passionate psychologist and a registered rehab professional with real experience in both the corporate and school education sector. She is an alumnus of University of Delhi and Jamia Millia University. She is empanelled as CBC counselor and a rehab psychologist for the last 10 years. She is working with the Manodarpan MHRD and CBSC headline. She is one of the founding members and resource persons of some eminent teachers forums and Intellify, which is a non-profit organization run by IIT Delhi students that creates online and offline learning resources 
for children from diverse backgrounds. Her endeavor is to create much needed awareness about mental health and break the stigma attached to mental illness, promote education especially for young girls, and has been conducting many free sessions and workshops for the same. She's currently pursuing her PhD. Ma'am, a very, very good evening and welcome back to the panel. We good evening. With us today. Good evening, ma'am. Welcome. Namaskar. We also have with us today Dr. Arun Prakash Sir, a noted educational administrator. Sir has received the national award for his outstanding contribution in the field of education from the former president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Dr. Prakash, a PhD degree holder, has more than 30 years of experience in education. He has been the founder principal of Delhi Public School, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, Pathway International School, Dubai, Delhi Public School, Guwahati, Delhi Public School, Bilaspur, Delhi Public School, Bogaiga, SAI International School, Bhavaneshwar. He is also been the principal of Delhi Public School, Porba, and founder chairman of Laurels International School, Allahabad. He is the director of Prince Dale Group, New Delhi a group engaged in enriching all the stakeholders in the field of education, including students, parents, teachers, principals, administrators, and school founders. Sir, a very, very good evening and welcome to the panel. We also have with us today, Nutan Budhiraja Ma'am. Ma'am holds a BA Honours in Political Science, MA in Political Science, MCN in Public Administration, and a BA. She had taught and headed American and IGCSC Cambridge curriculum in Middle East for more than uh, 30 years. She has also headed the team for American and QNSA accreditation process in two established schools, worked in some prestigious schools in Delhi and Mohali, taught in early university colleges, and had been the principal at Learning Path School, Mohali, a school ranked number one in the Mohali in the category of co day schools. Matt has published articles in journals and newspapers and awarded the Best Feature Award and SOF Best District Principals twice. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here today and always a privilege to have you back. Next we have with us Mr. Sasmita Mohanty Ma'am, Principal Sanjay Gunawat International School, Maharashtra. Academically qualified with the MA, BA, and MPhil, Ma'am is the founder of Kolapur Sahodaya Complex, a cluster of CBC schools, has worked as trainer and resource person for training on leadership, life skills, and career counseling by CBC Center of Excellence and have done master trainer course in career counseling by Central, Central of Excellency, CBC Pune. She has worked with principals, including Presidency School, Banaihara Road, Bangalore, Sanjeev and Public School, CBC Residential School at Panhala, Kolhapur, Maharashtra, and currently working as the Director Principal of Sanjay Bhadavad International School, Kolhapur, Maharashtra. Ma'am, a very, very good evening, and welcome to the panel. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. If I can kindly ask all my panelists to uh, unmute their, themselves and uh, switch on their cameras, we will start the panel. Uh, if I can first come to... Uh, I'm Adivan. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. So it's my opportunity to there with, we, with all of you and discuss on this very important topic that we are here to discuss, the progressive school. Yes, it has started long, long ago. But almost 60, 70 years of progressive schooling where we are. Maybe we have few schools, we have few maybe a small number of children, a small number of educationists working on this and calling they as a progressive school. What I particularly feel that progressive school is basically change when one-to-one -one education, personal education, education for self, producing and for the self, actualization, reaching something of your own, personal fulfillment, change that education is for society as well. So that was one shift when these progressive educators, the Dan, Devi, and all people said that education is not only for self in the traditional way, but a person who is the most suitable in the society tomorrow. 
if a person is going to be the most suitable in society tomorrow how he will be suitable so that shift of making a person to be the most suitable for the society where he is happy he is making others happy and he is able to reach the national goals the goals of the humanity and all around so progressive movement which is started that we should make a child fit whatever he is supposed to do in future requirements of the last century requirements which my father was studying required when i was studying requirement our children will go to the next level are totally different and when requirements are different movements which is started has the root progressive education and bits and pieces from all around taken for this purpose but i think uh, speakers have been talking very nicely what the progressive education what the components of the progressive education so i will not at this moment how difficult it is there to practice progressive education in fact we have two type of people one are educational policy makers they talk about all the possibilities good things they bring out whatever the best of best required and then second is ground reality when as a principal as a teacher as a educator as a parent we come across unfortunately we know what is progressive education we understand that we have to prepare for progressive education and for the century next century we know 21st century is skill but in classroom situation still things are not much changing what is the reason behind there are two three reasons which i could perceive one the quality check in education is not centralized in school can do very good teaching if they have good people to select the good teachers good salaries are given and good motivation is given to the teacher at the same time teachers are giving opportunity to explore and there are some people to train them and check and balances whether they are teaching or not suppose this is not there teachers are coming because there is nothing else to do they join the profession because of not choice but chance or there is nothing else left they come to the teaching training how much training we got when we came to the teaching field we all know other than b ed classes that also some of us did in service no other training was done the classrooms we learn whatever we wanted and we grew our own way and now what is happening such a vast number of children vast number of schools vast number of teacher without any system of checking the quality of teachers and quality of teaching whatever progressive education in theory we think that will not be possible maybe one school two school five school 100 schools will not make all the difference 100 200 children will be so brilliant even if you don't teach they can find out things from different sources and today's knowledge they can come out also so what is required very rigorous training of the teachers quality of teaching in the classroom and checks and balances what is to be done every teacher needs every teacher wants every teacher knows that it has to be child centric education i have observed thousands and thousands of classes i have founder principal of eight schools so every time recruiting new teacher new classes being part of many organization went to different school to see even the schools which all claim that we are very progressive we are doing they few of them are do many of them still they go to the classroom 
they dictate some questions children note down and if they ask some difficult questions teacher don't like it it is still scenario in our country most of the places we may not agree because we have to sell our school we not agree because we have to say that we are great educationists and we have to reform everything but practical reality is different unfortunately principals are so busy in every other area hardly they get time to be in the classroom or see the pedagogical things happening one round of the school two round of the school sitting seeing one class or some time or so that becomes the duty of the principal and then how much is delegated these things so these are scenarios what i am talking about progressive education is very very important progressive square education goal when it started was different today's goals are different today we have make in india today we have india signing today we have india is part of the world today globe is connected how much these values are taught in the classrooms how much these values are brought when one school keeps everything closed so that other school should not copy when teacher do not share notes with other teacher the teacher also may copy something from us these are the scenarios which are still happening so what i say yes so this is schooling is the only way for us to grow for us to survive for us to take lead and india being youngest nation will miss the bus if our people will not be skilled enough to take the job opportunity which is available today and all of you the panelists have been involved with education and biggest problem you will be facing today to select good teachers you may find someone who is very good educate maybe he knows and has the knowledge but passing on the knowledge to other person so that the person will be motivated to take this lesson in the life those people are missing so requirement is not only the theory requirement is more on the practicality not only on the classrooms not only the seminars but checks and balances in schools colleges and everywhere so that every child every person is fit to the society otherwise it will be same thing which our government says that 80% computer engineers of our country are non employable exactly same will happen all the pg those who are post graduates we cannot employ any one of them just in the classroom out of 100 say perhaps we get one or two who are suitable to teach in the classroom so this whole change is required to bring to the grassroots level that's what i want to propagate and tell to all of you thank you ma'am for giving chance thank you thank you so much sir for the wonderful deliberations and uh, your valuable input thank you once again uh, i would next come to himlata suri ma'am ma'am uh, my question to you would be how do we handle students of different backgrounds in the process of school uh, progress of school good evening namaskar and jai hind everyone and uh, it's again my pride and privilege to be back here on this wonderful uh, platform and gaguri i i must appreciate you and uh, team uh, notebook for bringing up such wonderful topics all the time the last topic which we uh, saw was again very nice and i would like uh, to express uh, my deliberate my points on how to handle uh, students with different backgrounds right in the process of progressive uh, schools basically so when yes, we think of progressive schools uh, we always uh, know that uh, what we understood i mean in the few past also that these are the schools which are progressive in approach they don't use mundane uh, typical methodologies and pedagogies of teaching they uh, look uh, they try to move away from textbooks they rather uh, uh, use uh, more flexibility in approach in their teachings and uh, learning techniques they are most activity based and uh, they are uh, one of the most important thing which i would like to mention like dr arun prakash said that we are the youngest nation 
and one more thing that we are the nation who who is low which is loaded with diversity we have diversities in uh, you name the thing and we have it that that kind of diversity none of the nation i mean nowhere in the world we can find so uh, that becomes even more challenging for all of us to deal with the students coming from backgrounds it is not just their religion their languages their uh, uh, caste their creeds their uh, i mean regional their geographical places but also uh, the cultural differences which we face and then uh, comes this uh, marginalized marginalized uh, background and many 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 uh, multifold factors which we which we see so education as we know it's not just education it is we prepare them for life as uh, sir dr prakash said very rightly but then uh, at times you know we fail due to the numbers we need to handle that is something which actually is challenging but uh, uh, bharat sir has mentioned that uh, they are not actually meant for masses these progressive schools still uh, we are trying to imbibe the normal usual like regular schools are trying to get into such a space because nep is forcing us to do this nep is uh, uh, actually uh, wanting us to be activity based we have to be flexible we have to be very uh, tailor made to the need uh, to the needs of the see what kind of learners we are facing Uh, having in the school uh, situation so it's very important that we uh, look into these things and we uh, see the level of their exposure, ex uh, exposure and their uh, also the kind of the background they are coming from what kind of learning gaps or learning difficulties they are facing so that is something which is very important here so we need to strategize our education our uh, themes in the classes as per the learners who are there so uh, if you look at the educational system abroad i mean you, if you see they they uh, force they focus so much on psychosocial development social emotional learning is be becomes the center i mean so it's very important there that we have those uh, social intelligence you know those uh, social quotients more developed in students you know they become uh more uh, on citizenship they are more collaborative they help each other they are sensitive they have empathy so life skills and social emotional skills are uh, the ones which are and and as i work very closely with cbsc so we know that we are heading towards uh, those things so uh, dr arun prakash the picture is not that gloomy sir so we are working on them and uh, we just celebrated 75th uh, episode of life skill adolescent training program so there are many school all over the india these jnvs kvs everyone comes and participates in that so this is something these little little things the boards are doing and we are also doing them at school and we are trying to integrate the learners from various backgrounds and there uh, we actually have to have special education plays a very important role here special education is all about uh, inclusiveness uh, i mean including uh, including and catering to all uh, diverse types of learners from various backgrounds you know so that is something uh, which uh, gives it a very important space and since we all know that it is mandatory for us to have special educators and counselors and have that space where we actually uh, work on their uh, learning issues and behavioral issues and their uh, if if at all we have some uh, first generation learners we are able to cater to them so those and then also we uh, special education as you said rightly pointed out that it also uh, uh, caters to the students who are above average who are uh, i mean who are uh, uh, blessed with the more to learn i mean so uh, these are the students who are also under special education so in a regular classroom due to the numbers the teacher is not able to 
handle them. So there uh, we try and create spaces which understand their needs, which understands their capabilities, which is actually very important here. And then uh, we also try and create some ongoing projects there, which are very pertinent to their learning and they are relatable to them. And then uh, we try not to give them very heavy homework, especially children coming from uh, neglected backgrounds and uh, coming from a marginalized section of the society. And they, uh, because now it is mandatory to admit all uh, the students, even special needs, uh, children with special needs, CWSs are also included in admission process and children from EWS background. So it is very, very challenging and it is imperative that we try to get everyone on at equal uh, platform. You know, we try to do that in every possible way. To, and uh, most of the time it's the policies which are there and thankfully they are there in black and white, but then implementation is all about the willingness which we, uh, I agree there with you, sir. So implementation has to be there. It has to be an attitudinal change there. So very important here that we have to engage them in the school, we have to motivate them, and uh, we have to also uh, get them to the level from where they can begin. So learning gaps, cap capping those learning gaps is again something which is very important. So training at that level uh, to these uh, students and extra coaching on technological knowledge and exposure becomes uh, the school's duty here. So this is how uh, we try and then we try to not give them very heavy homework because at times the parents at home being the first generation learner, it becomes very challenging for such parents to help them out. So we try and manage them at the school and then uh, we also uh, try to have the uh, uh, good happy background which is which has not got so many uh, very strict rules which are very consequential when it comes to not following those rules. So having less of those uh, things and then also working on uh, those 21st century skills, which is very important here. So we have to start from very base, basic things when we handle these situations in school and uh, try to use as much as uh, the progressive approach, which is like growth mindset is very important here. One of the very important 21st century skill, collaboration, creativity is always welcome because they bring in a lot of ideas to the classroom and to the table when these children, because they, as it is, their exposure is much more than uh, the child who comes from a very product, protective background because of their background or maybe their exposure, the way uh, they deal with life day-to-day -day basis because they, their life is basically based on need, not like uh, too much of luxurious life is not there. So that is why we must have uh, these uh, all these uh, students from various backgrounds, diverse background, and it is actually high on agenda. So... Uh, create that inclusivity from this diverse background amongst the students, so which is very important thing. And at the moment, I think inclusion is something which we always look forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for those inputs. Uh, I would next come to Sasmita Mahanti, ma'am. Ma'am, a very good evening. Uh, thank you so much for being here in the panel. Uh, my question to you would be, ma'am, what is your advice for students, uh, teachers, not students, in the process of progressive schooling now. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks to Notebook for this opportunity. And uh, uh, I would uh, like to thank all the previous speakers. Uh, it was really nice to have so much of input. Uh, categorically, I would uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Arun Prakash because uh, you know, there was so much of similarity in the challenges and thought process, uh, what we carry and we understand as educators. Uh, uh, I also, uh, you know, undergo the process of because we have a huge school, a large number of students, uh, recruitment keep happening, uh, uh, you know, in a uh, mass, uh, massive scale. So uh, there is always a big challenge that um, how do you choose your teacher and then uh, after teaching uh, there is a saying that uh, always we say that uh, where do we get good teachers and then we start uh, answering ourselves good teacher to milte nahi ho banana padta hai 
So we have to keep uh, training them, uh, hand holding, and uh, you know, providing them time to time uh, a variety of exposure. That's the way uh, how we start uh, educating the teachers. And it's really very challenging to be a progressive school because if you are not a progressive school, then uh, you do more harms than doing good to the uh, future generation. So uh, you know very well that you have to move with the time. And uh, when you have to move with the time, you do not know what are the jobs available for these young students after 10 years or after uh, eight years. We don't know anything. So what we can do that we have to uh, provide them with the skill sets. And uh, when we talk about skilling the uh, younger children, so we get the challenge from the parent side because uh, there is a group of parents, those they are always behind marks. So uh, that becomes very challenging even for the teachers because uh, teachers say that uh, when we uh, prepare the students on the basis of what is expected, that uh, conceptually they should be strong, they should be uh, doing variety of activities and understanding things. So that time the question comes that uh, there are parents, those that are expecting that the child also to be doing, getting uh, out of out marks in different subjects. So uh, we uh, keep working with the educators uh, time to time uh, after the appointment, then there is orientation, then there is after orientation, there is always collaboration. As we have international school, uh, CBAC school, so what we do, there is always collaboration happening between the teachers from both the uh, curriculum. So there is something new which is coming out from the uh, other section. It is always shared. It's not that uh, uh, everything, whatever is there in the international curriculum, uh, that is the best. It's not like that. So always exchange of thought process, ideas, training. It's a continuous ongoing process. And then we uh, uh, prepare them uh, through the, uh, uh, you know, the basis of uh, micro uh, handling, making the lesson plan. As Dr. Arun Prakas was telling that it's very difficult to go uh, for the principal to the classes and observe the classes, it's very difficult. But then uh, I would appreciate that for the first time, uh, uh, CBAC has uh, made the effort that the principal to become the pedagogical leader. And then principal need to uh, prepare the entire curriculum along with the subject experts for the school. Gone are those days that the principal has to be busy with uh, uh, electrician work or the plumbing work or the, uh, uh, you know, the maintenance work or uh, daily firefighting work. Uh, now the principal has to be in charge for the uh, delivery of the curriculum and the effectiveness of the teaching learning process. So that has brought a big change among all the principals. And uh, now uh, we find that most of the, in most of the schools, principals, they get into the classes, observe the classes. And then there is uh, also uh, mandatory training hours are there for CBSC. That these many uh, training hours for the educators, it is mandatory and it need to be done and uploaded and the report to be submitted. So that has created uh, some kind of uh, feeling among all the schools that every uh, uh, month we see it's not that only one school or uh, few reputed schools are organizing training for the teachers. Even in the villages, schools have become aware and they're organizing training program because it is mandatory of uh, 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 certain hours of training for the teachers to be completed. So that is helping uh, somehow for the uh, schools and the educators to uh, go ahead uh, out of the traditional system and to progress. But then uh, it's very, very challenging because uh, even the mindset of the uh, principals and management also is slowly changing. 
uh, earlier uh, they used to think that if uh, there is something is going to be collaborated with the other school or there is some kind of uh, 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 you know hand holding or support is coming from other school it might affect uh, the admission of a school so everybody used to have that closed system that whatever we are doing it's our uh, uh, intellectual property it's our uh, idea so it need not to be shared but now everything is open we find out that uh, the mindset of the principals have been changed now. Even the smallest of the school is trying to improve and then uh, they are uh, ready to take, they're ready to give and they're open for uh, organizing uh, events, collaborating with the school and bigger school also are having open minded that uh, gone at those days that uh, uh, you know, one individual to be standing and saying that we are the best. Now we have to uh, take the community together, take the other schools along with us. So there is a lot of developmental activities uh, going on and schools are trying to change themselves in a uh, huge manner. And uh, this has been uh, observed uh, in the recent uh, months. And uh, as you said that, there is... Uh, a process in my school we have a process that uh, how do we train the last person because i have got 500 teachers working in my school so what we do we have a practice and a policy that any teacher is going to go for a training that teacher has to give training to another 15 teachers and these 15 teachers are going to give training to another 100 teachers so this is how the process continue and uh, there is always uh, 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 in the weekly uh, timetable, the time is there that training program is going to happen from one or the other individual where the teachers are going to be given some kind of uh, new learning. And besides that, everybody is not uh, so uh, good at, uh, at certain things for example we try out and we explore variety of things uh, for example uh, technologically if we want to make our uh, children to be good then first the teachers need to be good so for the teachers uh, video making video editing uh, artificial intelligence machine learning all these things they also have to learn and they also have to, we have a um, robotic lab, uh, we have auto tinkering uh, lab. So then uh, teachers are part of uh, all these activities. We have exhibitions. Uh, when the exhibition happens, then there is sharing of ideas happens not only between the auto tinkering lab teacher and the computer teacher, but the subject teachers. So everybody is part of it. So that is uh, learning is... Uh, happening and uh, that gives uh, a lot of scope for having a progressive mindset among the teachers and uh, uh, once the teacher develops this uh, attitude that okay uh, every day we need to upgrade ourselves uh, every day we need to have new learning and all teachers are convinced with the idea of lifelong learners and along with learning on learning also is happening simultaneously because uh, sometimes whatever we have learned earlier, okay, this is the method we have to go to the class and deliver the lecture and come out. So uh, we uh, need to change that practices and it has almost already changed because today everything is practical based. I uh, mean, uh, today evening we have a grow agro club. So this grow agro club has uh, grown uh, spinach. And then they, after growing the spinach, all those children, they were so happy that they had brought one, one bundle of spinach. And they came to show me that this is what we have grown in our club activity. And they are so happy to carry that bundle of spinach home. And I'm sure that they would go and tell to their mothers that, okay, this is going to be cooked. And uh, I'm sure most of them might not be liking the spinach, what is come from the market and cooked at home. But as they have grown it, they're going to eat it. So uh, this is what uh, we we try to uh, do different things, but it's very, very uh, challenging. And um, uh, educating and upgrading teacher is very uh, highly, uh, what do you say, uh, demanding task because uh, nobody wants to become teacher. That is another challenge. 
Uh, and if you uh, ask that uh, I have 4,500 students, if I'll ask that what do you want to become, not a single one will tell that I want to become a teacher. So then we, uh, but every parent want that their child to study under a good teacher. So uh, that becomes another challenge that how do we hunt and get good teachers unless and until uh, uh, the quality of training, quality of education, quality of mindset of teachers, because many teachers come into the profession without having passion, without having interest. So it has just become a job. So when you do a job, uh, uh, you feel that uh, the task is completed and the uh, uh, job is done. But then touching the young mind and heart, it is left out. So if we have to touch the young mind and the heart, because that is the biggest thing what needs to be done in 21st century, because resources are available, informations are available, everything is available. But then uh, the teacher role is changing. Teacher role now is more to uh, become uh, morally and uh, psychologically, emotionally uh, involved with the child and uh, involved to create a good human being. So uh, that's very important role the teachers need to uh, play. And uh, uh, I feel that, uh, you know, it's a, a long uh, journey. And in due course of time, there is a lot of development and a lot of uh, uh, changes are going on. But in due course of time, I think uh, even the, uh, uh, the quality and then the training and then the uh, progressiveness of the teachers, the mindset of the teachers, everything going to change. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable input. Uh, uh, I would come to Nutan Budhiraja, ma'am. I'm so sorry for keep you waiting. Uh, I hope and welcome uh, to the panel. And my question to you would be, what is the role of uh, parents in progressive schooling, ma'am, as for you? Good evening. Um, and uh, Good evening. no, perfectly fine. I, I was uh, not waiting. I was actually listening. And uh, everyone who talked added to my information. And personally, I'm very excited at this whole idea of um, uh, this whole idea of, uh, you know, um, um, progressive education, progressive schooling, uh, for the simple reason that while it may be a success, uh, while it may have been in, in, uh, in the domain of educationists for the past uh, uh, so many years in the West and in Europe, and they may have probably been able to, you know, crack it all out and uh, made some progress there. Um, the excitement to, with, with somebody like me is simply because it is coming to India. It's not just coming to India by way of a thought, which we probably were very much uh, familiar with, but it's also coming with a policy behind it. It's also coming with a political will behind it. It's also coming with the idea that, uh, okay, we need to be doing something, not just for the select few or the privileged few, but something which is um, across the board, en masse. And yes, India is a big country and uh, there are many stakeholders. And yes, there are these uh, different perspectives that we have when we enter into this domain. And, um, so uh, progressive education, progressive schooling, progressive curriculum is definitely the way to go. And the kind of political will that we are seeing with the NEP that has come in, uh, where we are talking about a holistic development and not just looking at textbook learning and marks and you know cracking the board exams. I think that's very interesting. And in many ways, this is addressing the needs of almost all the parents. Uh, when we were a student, I remember um, I used to be unhappy with the kind of road learning that I had to go through because I wasn't very good at it. And um, I relate to it when today's students also find it difficult. My parents also uh, very much understood what I was wanting to say, but they had, they had very little options. They had to go along with the system that was in place. Now that the system is changing, now that the structure is changing, now that it is allowing uh, things to happen in a manner which is so much more modern and student-centric and student-oriented, uh, I think the parents have a bigger role to play than ever before. They can't just stand there as mute witnesses to whatever is unfolding. Uh, the parents' responsibility till some point of time was only about questioning the school and the teachers and the marks that the student got. But with progressive curriculum schooling, I think the parents will have to do a lot more than just question. They would also have to share their bit of responsibility. They would also have to be accountable for their own child's learning. And uh, it all begins with the uh, parent trying to understand, uh, you know, what is the vision of the school? What is the mission of the school? What are the objectives and goals of the school? What is this school all about where I'm putting my child? 
And once you understand that, therefore, there is no surprise to a parent. When this child comes back home and says, there are no questions to be answered from the back of the book, but I have a research to do, I have a project to do, I have a collaboration to do with a group. So parents will understand that my child is in a school, in an environment where it's not about notebooks, textbooks, writing answers, learning them, or copying them, right? So the parents need to therefore be informed. They need to be educated. And we are using the word educated, not because they are illiterate, but simply because uh, what it means to be a part of a progressive school uh, would demand the parents to understand the whole scene much more better. The child, when he goes back home, should not go to a world which is totally alien to him. In a school, we've made efforts to create an environment of collaboration, critical thinking, high order, synthesis, evaluations, and all of those things. You're moving away from understanding and, uh, and remembering. You're moving on to high order thinking skills. The Bloom's taxonomy really comes into big role play with the progressive education. So the parents need to be a part of this entire uh, ball game. They need to understand what this whole school is all about, what this teaching style is changing. It's not the way I did. It's a different kind of a thing. The reasons are different. The times are different. The reason for preparation are very different. The school and the parent, therefore, need to be in sync with each other. The parents need to understand that the schools have moved away from teacher centering, like a sage on a stage. That's no longer the nature of a teacher anymore. It's about um, the student-centered education that's happening. We're worried about the learning styles of the students. We are wanting to now therefore uh, work with the students at their level. If a child is, uh, for example, struggling with the mathematical concepts and probably traditional methods are going to work better over there. But if a child is wanting to, you know, uh, is ahead of the others in the class and therefore wants to have some much more challenging task given to him, parents need to appreciate that this child from the school is getting some enrichment activities or enrichment work being given to him. The idea being not to penalize the child, but to allow the child to grow in an area where he thinks, where, where the child feels that he's much more competent to be able to develop. And so the interest of the child is not diminished. In fact, it is triggered. In fact, it is ignited more. And the parents need to therefore understand why their child is given a particular kind of a task by the school. And for that, it is again very important for a school, a teacher, and a parent to be in total and continuous communication. The parents should never be in the dark as to what the school is planning to do, what the school's approach is, why is the child doing whatever he's doing, why is there so much of project and group work happening, why is there peer learning happening in the school, why is my student, my child's work being checked by a friend sitting with him on the same desk, all these things are part of the progressive education. And so the parents need to understand, appreciate, and therefore in many ways support their child's learning. The child, when he comes back home, should come back to parents who are receptive and not critical. The, the child, when he comes back home to parents, should be one who's going to support the child in whatever has begun in the school and take it to its ultimate culmination. So I think the parents have a bigger role to play. And uh, I'm very happy with this whole idea of an NEP coming in, talking about holistic education. They're talking about parent engagement uh, in four different ways. They talk about blended teaching. They're talking about textbook coming out in different languages so that the parents can read and engage more with the kind of textbooks that are out there in their bilingual languages, for example. Um, in zero to eight years, uh, the, the schools, the NEP would want the parents to be directly engaged. You know, they're talking about poems and storytelling and role plays and those kind of things. So um, parents have a big role to play. Again, come back to that. The success of a progressive schooling education is highly dependent upon a satisfied parent. And a satisfied parent would be one who is happy with a child coming back home with the kind of learning that the school has provided. Um, agreed that not all parents understand the concept of uh, progressive education. They don't need to be given a history or a, or a lesson on the growth of progressive education. They need to be just told about what progressive education means to them, to their child, and what the school expects of them. So I think that's going to be a brilliant move if and when it happens. It's going to take time, no doubt about it. Parents would be only happy in getting a report card that shows an A+. Plus. We have to tell the parents that A+, plus is not going to get your child anywhere. With the 21st century kind of skills that we're looking at, it has to be way beyond 99s and 90 pluses. So um, educating the parents, making them partners, uh, making them collaborators, engaging them in the school activities for the ultimate um, you know, academic enhancement, empowerment of the student is so very essential. And uh, take time, but it'll happen as long as, uh, as long as the schools, the managements, 
the, the political will, the big wigs, they all understand that we have a lot to gain out of this whole movement that is probably going to take place on a mass scale across the board in India for the first time um, since the whole model of education began in our country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It has been my absolute pleasure and privilege to host this wonderful, wonderful panel today. Very, very valuable inputs. And I, my heartfelt thanks to you to Saspita Mahanti, ma'am, Hemlata Suri, ma'am, Nutin Budhayaja, ma'am, and Dr. Arun Prakash, sir. Would like to call uh, Achit Bhattacharya back for the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Gauri. I think a wonderful session. Uh, very seamless Absolutely. and uh, very value adding. Barsa, thank you so much uh, for your wonderful deliberation. Very mature and very balanced. Uh, although today, coincidentally, uh, I had to go first. But I'm sure, sir, with, uh, with your years of experience and with your deliberation, no one apart from you can steal the thunder. Wonderful, sir. Well, thank you, Achan. But you know, you, you made such an impact on your first speech that I think I'll go second now. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, always, always it's you first, sir, as an opening batsman. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arun Prakash. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for being a part of the panel and for your wonderful deliberation. I think uh, very, some very important points we made, sir, including the fact that the broader objective of ensuring that students are ready for the society, most suitable in the society as, as citizens. And also, I think you highlighted uh, very importantly the ground realities, the practical challenges that schools have been facing, educators have been facing, and especially what happened in the past 50, 60 years. And I think uh, the other point that you also made is uh, the importance of it, and also the fact that, of course, we all understand that how busy the principals uh, are with so much on their plates. So, well, thank you, sir. We all uh, stand to collectively gain from your wisdom. Himalata Suri, ma'am, uh, thank you again for being a part of the panel. Ma'am, it's always a pleasure to host you. I think a few very important points we made, first of all, uh, uh, the fact that a step in the right direction, NEP coming in, activity based learning, of course, we all look forward to it. And the other part is, uh, I think the importance of inclusiveness, diversity, especially in the context of special education. I think that's a wonderful way of uh, looking at the topic. And very relevant as well. Thank you, ma'am, for that. Shashmita Mohanty, ma'am, uh, thank you so much. I think you made a very valid point in the fact that uh, importance of teachers training and how important teachers are, how important educators are for our next generation. You know, I think that all of us would completely agree. And also, the the changing role of principal in terms of more involvement in the pedagogy, in terms of mandatory training hours. So I think some, some wonderful uh, points you brought to the forum. Ma Thank you so much for that. Nutan Buddhiraja, ma'am, I think two very important points you made. Of course, the fact that earlier parents had very little option and now they have a much bigger role to play. It's not only about judging the school, but also their active involvement in this regard. And of course, it, the, the, the complete ecosystem, the impact of things like Bloom's taxonomy, et cetera, on this topic. So I think overall, we had a great session, a very value adding. And I'm sure members of the esteemed audience uh, stand to gain immensely from the collective wisdom of the panel here. We look forward to such enriching sessions in the future as well. I thank all of you for your great support in taking this webinar forward. Look forward to your continued participation in the future session. Thank you. Take thank care. You. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir.